Master of the Art of Bodybuilding, trainer par excellence, and former Mr. Universe, Mike Mincer. Not infrequently, I am told by bodybuilders that they enjoy the personal fashion in which my articles and books communicate to them. My writings are meaningful to many because in addition to dealing with limited bodybuilding issues, I also address their deepest concerns and interests. For instance, scores of bodybuilders from around the world who read my book, Heavy Duty One, have informed me that it seemed like chapter one, entitled Bodybuilders Are Confused, was written specifically with him in mind. That through some special power, I was able to divine what was in his soul and then make explicitly clear what he had only kinda, sorta known, or had merely sensed theretofore. Each was effusively grateful for what in effect was my having lifted the veil of mystification that had enshrouded his thinking and kept him confused on the subject of how to best proceed with his training. I accomplished this by logically identifying the nature and source of their confusion. It is this, understanding the nature and source of one's confusion, which is the first step toward resolving it. And make no mistake, confusion, self-doubt, and uncertainty can be monstrously intolerable, most assuredly incompatible with self-esteem, confidence, and happiness. Of course, I possess no special, non-rational insight which enables me to perceive things that others do not. I have diligently trained myself to use logic to be able to make valid, philosophic, scientific identifications of the facts of reality something that anyone with a normal, intact, functioning brain and the appropriate motivation can learn to do. Which brings me to the subject of the purpose of these audio tapes. It is not my intention to merely provide the listener with another bodybuilding program and expect you to then blindly follow it. That would not be worth much long range. Instead, my purpose is to teach you to think logically about training and nutrition so that ultimately you'll be able to think independently about these subjects and thus become your own trainer, your own coach, and never again have to rely on the suspect opinion of others. And how do you put a price tag on that? That would be of inestimable value, for as wonderful as it may be to have a well-developed physique, without the ability to think logically and effectively about a subject that you have been passionately committed to, you are, in effect, consigning yourself to living as one half of a human being, a muscular individual who can't even think about that which is of enormous concern and interest. An interesting side note here, it was just six years ago that I decided to undertake a study and gain as thorough an understanding as possible of the nature of logic. I did so to improve my thinking on all important issues, including the theory of high intensity training. I realized that if I wanted to be better able to develop my training clients' muscles, I had to further develop my mind. In the process of learning to think logically about bodybuilding, you'll learn something about the nature of thought itself, which can then be extended to other areas of life. And with continued effort and study, you'll soon make the delightful discovery that you've been developing your intellectual range and thereby maturing as a human being should. The practical result is that you become a more efficacious individual with considerable dominion or control over his being. Why not consecrate this moment to that goal of not just actualizing your full muscular potential, but to the constant active expansion of your knowledge to an ever widening range of achievement, including the reaching of your full human stature, which can be accomplished only by learning how to think properly, logically, not merely about the best manner in which to proceed with your bodybuilding, but about all of the crucial fundamental issues of human existence. It was Aristotle, the discoverer of the laws of logic, the principles of thought, who said that a friend is that other person in whom one sees himself, one's values reflected in the person of another. Those who find my philosophy interesting and attractive share a certain mutuality of values with me if not always on the level of explicit verbalized understanding, at least in terms of subconscious, emotional, or sense of life affinity. I find this encouraging as I have worked conscientiously over a span of many years developing my philosophy, especially that aspect of most central significance, my values, which are of a positive nature. Specifically, I value reason, objectivity, logic, knowledge, science, 
human progress and happiness. The reason why the world has descended to the lowest rung of hell in man's history is because, despite the lip service paid them, such life-affirming values no longer predominate. The fact that so many bodybuilders possess a pro-mind, pro-life philosophy, or sense of life, means that there is still hope for man's long-range survival and success. What relevance do these issues have in a tape series about bodybuilding? They are eminently relevant. If you are sincerely interested in developing your body, the most vitally important aspect, of course, being the brain. Bear in mind that bodybuilding does not exist in a vacuum apart from the rest of life, and that as a human being, knowledge is your means of achieving your goals. So, of course, the greater your knowledge, the greater your ability to reason, the more likely you'll achieve your goals. Lacking the rudiments of rationality necessary to critically analyze ideas, the average bodybuilder today finds himself impotently bewildered, awash in an oceanic proliferation of new theories on training and nutrition. Unable to even begin to properly evaluate or judge the flood of conflicting, contradictory misinformation, most bodybuilders flounder helplessly, taking years and years to develop a physique they could have, should have obtained in months, or allowing the flame of their passion for a more muscular physique to be extinguished, they either cease their training efforts entirely or continue going to the gym merely as a social ritual to temporarily stave off the inevitable consequences of their refusal to think, namely anxiety and fear. Just a few days ago, while explaining to one of my local training clients the reasons for working out only once every four to seven days, a man in his mid-thirties, whom I've seen in the gym training every day for years, and with nothing to show for it, had apparently overheard my explanation and intoned, Mr. Menser, what you just said about training so infrequently sounded intelligent and logical, but if I don't train every day, what else am I going to do with my time? I was astonished at such a question, as the individual obviously didn't understand that he was implicitly admitting that his life had been one enormous betrayal. Why, sir, I responded, I might suggest a number of things for your consideration. Read a novel or philosophy book by Ayn Rand. Learn the laws of logic. Translate what you had merely sensed about the nature of existence into an explicitly verbalized philosophy of life. Why, you might even study neuroanatomy and physiology. Yes, neuroanatomy and physiology. I'm always amazed at how much human beings take for granted their sacred existence. Or take up a trade, enroll in a class, go to the movies, take walks in the park. You might even learn about the true nature of romantic love. In short, you might seek to actualize your human stature. He scratched his head and said half-heartedly, yeah, I suppose I could find something to do. As a microcosm of the culture at large, the bodybuilding subculture, too, exhibits an appalling lack of respect for truth, knowledge, logic, and rationality. In certain cases, so great is the distance of ideas in this field from reality, one might characterize them as reflective of a type of modern madness or schizophrenia. For instance, the premise that there is no such thing as overtraining, only under eating. This idea represents the apotheosis of irrational thinking in this field as it contradicts the most basic fundamental principles of bodybuilding nutritional science. A brief logical critical analysis of this idea will reveal it immediately as a monumental absurdity. The notion that there is no such thing as overtraining, only undereating, implies that if you will only agree to overeat, then you can infinitely extend the limit to which you can train to stimulate the body to grow. And this simply is not true, because the supply of biochemical resources used up in the process of training to induce growth stimulation is, of course, strictly limited and cannot be restored instantaneously, which would have to be the case for this assertion to have any merit, no matter how much or how often one eats. Therefore, the amount of training one may engage in before it becomes overtraining is strictly limited. And if it were possible to infinitely extend the degree to which growth could be stimulated through the indefinite extension of training time and of the amount of food consumed, there would already be a legion of bodybuilders whose muscular development 
would far exceed that of Dorian Yates, as most bodybuilders today are chronically, grossly overtrained and overnourished. Despite being touted as the science of modern bodybuilding, very few have engaged in any rigorous scientific thinking on the subject. In fact, the legitimate scientific medical community has long looked upon weight training rather gingerly, only recently according it a minuscule respect. The actual value of bodybuilding goes largely unnoticed because of the preponderance of low-grade mentalities controlling it. Unlike the hallowed researchers and practitioners of Western theoretical medical science, who rightfully pride themselves on exacting intellectual standards and noble ethical principles, too many of those involved in the sport industry of bodybuilding and to a significant degree exercise science have no explicit intellectual standards and worse, their degree of control has emboldened them such that they actually take pride in violating ethical principles with promiscuous abandon. Unfortunately, too many of the self-styled experts in this field not only fail to make a nominal effort to stay apprised of the latest state-of-the-art knowledge, they actively evade such knowledge and even work diligently to suppress valid ideas that would help people to achieve greater progress as well as to protect their health. Sheer innocent ignorance is one thing, but the conscious evasion and willful suppression of life-enhancing knowledge is another. The motive of such people is the irrational desire to project and protect an image of incontestable superiority and omniscient infallibility. Such only serves, of course, to make them look ridiculously pathetic and to pose a threat to the young and innocent who are apt to be duped by the crude sophistry of these not-so-big big shots. When someone establishes himself as an authority in bodybuilding or nutrition, or any other arena involving human well-being, that individual has an enormous ethical responsibility to do everything within his power to keep abreast of the latest word in human thought in that field. So there is absolutely no excuse for the bodybuilding orthodoxy after 50 years to continue promulgating the notion that more is better, advocating that bodybuilders train for hours a day, six days a week. This I submit is really obscene, as the dangers of overtraining have been described and well documented for decades. My goodness, the issue is human well-being. What does it take to make some people indignant? While those I just described should be censored heavily, they are instead among the most successful in this industry. Some may recall from my book, Heavy Duty One, that just as there are those individuals who do not tolerate exposure to high intensity sunlight stress as well as others, with albinos, Scandinavians, and light skinned people at the far left end of the continuum, and dark skinned types and Negroes at the other, so there exists a similar situation with regard to individual exercise stress tolerance with those who don't tolerate exercise stress well at one extreme and those who do at the other. To advocate that all bodybuilders, or any for that matter, should train for hours a day is like suggesting that everyone, without regard for genetic considerations, should expose themselves to the intense summer sunlight at the equator for two hours. And when I speak of the dangers of overtraining, it is not merely that overtraining is counterproductive in that it hampers your training progress, it may be life-threatening, as the recent research of Dr. Kenneth Cooper indicates. This is not so difficult to understand when you consider that intense weight training is a form of stress on the human physiology. And who has to be reminded that we are all rather delicate and vulnerable as living organisms? It only stands to reason that chronic, gross overtraining could inordinately tax the overall physical system and possibly result in a breakdown where there might be a weak link such as the glandular system. Dr. Cooper, in fact, attributes the lymph cancer of Lemieux, the hockey great, as well as that of Marty LaQuarrie, the distance runner, to overtraining. While the science of productive bodybuilding exercise is not infinitely complex, there's considerably more to it than the childlike simplistic notion that more is better. As children, many gain the notion that more jelly beans are better than less, then carry that unchecked, unchallenged premise through life 
and misapply it to many subjects, such as bodybuilding science. In fact, if you reflect for a moment, you'll realize that the more is better jelly bean premise is wrong too. Beyond a definite limited point, jelly beans make you sick, fat, and may cause dental problems. The premise more is better is actually an ethico-economic principle, i.e., more money, more knowledge, more values are better than less. One cannot take a principle from ethics or economics and apply it blindly to another context, such as bodybuilding, and expect any meaningful results. The premise more is better means precisely that. More is better means more is better. Look at the implicit logic listener. There is a built-in guarantee. If 20 sets are good, 40 sets are even better, and 80 sets better still. You can't lose. The more exercise you perform, the better your progress. Again, it's a built-in guarantee. So why not just take off of work for three months, train 18 hours a day, and you'll reach Mr. Olympia caliber? You see now how useful logic is. It is man's method of gaining knowledge, which is, again, his means of survival, and is therefore that of most fundamental importance in human life. Man is not an instinctual creature. Instincts are a form of knowledge that are hardwired into animals and therefore guide them automatically and unerringly. Man is a conceptual being who gains and uses knowledge only by a volitional cognitive effort. And it is because one must exercise his power of choice, exert a specific effort of will to initiate and sustain a process of thought that many don't do it. They apparently find the effort involved too much or not to their liking. Having been brought up in an anti-rational culture, many are not taught to value logic and thus never achieve intellectual self-sufficiency, i.e. the ability to think rationally and to judge independently. They have uncritically accepted faith as a means of knowledge. And faith is the antithesis of reason. It is the blind acceptance of ideas for which there is no rational proof or sensory evidence. And they were taught to judge not, or the secular version, to keep an open mind. The idea that one should not judge or that he should keep an open mind is very dangerous. It is used to keep people confused by suggesting it is a virtue to grant plausibility to anything. Obviously, not everything can be true. Instead, one should cultivate an active mind, one that treats ideas critically, seeking to distinguish truth from falsehood. The approach of most bodybuilders to training from the start amounts to little more than a blind leap into the dark. Throughout life, we all encounter innumerable theories on the subject, from religion to philosophy, to politics, to the healing arts, nutrition, and bodybuilding science. And because so few in our culture were taught to think rationally or to judge critically, most are left disconcertingly confused when confronted with the necessity of making intellectual choices, such as which training theory to employ. I realized that I was like this when I reached my late teens. Most symptomatic was my notion that if something was printed, it had to be true. I learned later that my notion was illogical, of course. Not every idea can be true since so many of them conflict with and contradict other ideas. It was Arthur Jones who divested me of this bit of ragtag illogic when he barked, Mike, just because something is printed doesn't mean it's true. In fact, 90% of what is printed on all subjects is outright hogwash. And now, some 25 years, considerable thought, study, and experience later, I realized Mr. Jones was being charitable. It's more like 98% of what is printed on most subjects is garbage. Understanding this is an important first step in developing one's critical ability. The purpose of my writing and communications with others, in addition to providing rational training guidance, is to help achieve an ideal society via a cultural revolution that will bring men back to reason and logic, the only means of solving the problems threatening our very survival. Wouldn't it be interesting if bodybuilders, so often thought of as mindless, were instrumental in helping save the world? But why not? After all, it was the ancient Greeks who lived not in a dark age as we are today, but a golden age which exalted the power of man's mind, 
yet simultaneously idealize the beauty of the human body. Many may recall that the orienting principle of their philosophy was a healthy mind and a healthy body. If more bodybuilders would simply reappropriate some of their teeming passion to the mind, philosophy, and logic, they could literally be instrumental in helping to save or at least redirect the world onto a more rational course. The majority of those listening have heard of the Greek dictum, a healthy mind and a healthy body, which fact played a part in the naming of my new book, Heavy Duty Two: Mind and Body. As stated previously, man is not an instinctual creature, but a conceptual being. The power or health of an individual man's mind is directly proportional to his conceptual range, i.e., the number of concepts his mind has integrated, how well he understands their exact meaning, and the number of logical connections he has made among them. As a human being, you have no choice as to whether you need a conceptual grasp of reality, that is a philosophy. To quote Ayn Rand on this matter, your only choice is whether you define your philosophy by a conscious, rational, disciplined process of thought and scrupulously logical deliberation, or let your subconscious accumulate a junk heap of unwarranted conclusions, false generalizations, undefined contradictions, undigested slogans, unidentified doubts, wishes, and fears, thrown together by chance, but integrated by your subconscious into a kind of mongrel philosophy and fused into a single solid weight. Self-doubt, like a ball and chain where your mind's wings of confidence should have grown. Close quote. The purpose of a proper study of philosophy is to gain a fully defined and consistent view of life based on a clear, first-hand understanding of objective principles. A firm intellectual grasp of objective principles is an absolute requirement to learn to think and judge independently and thereby enable one to achieve rational goals. The most important principle one need grasp to achieve dominion over his being and to achieve his goals, whether he desires to develop larger muscles, a successful business, or a happy marriage, is the law of causality or cause and effect. It was philosophy's discovery and explicit statement of the law of causality that provided man with the intellectual base that made for the vast superiority of Western culture and its control over reality as expressed through the achievements of mathematics, medicine, physics, engineering, and all other sciences. The law of causality states that an entity can act only in accord with its own nature and cannot act otherwise. Or, a rock cannot fly, a muscle cannot grow without the imposition of the requisite stimulus, and man cannot properly exist as anything other than man, i.e. the rational animal. Those who do not possess an explicit understanding of philosophic fundamentals, such as cause and effect, have a very difficult time achieving their goals. Lacking aware of the role of fundamental principles in guiding one's life, they are, for the most part, emotionally driven instead of conceptually directed. They seem to operate on the fuzzy notion that if their mere desire to achieve a goal is strong enough, such will suffice. And having never made it a policy to check for inappropriate mental habits, they semi-consciously resort to the unchallenged premise, more is better. If stated in words, their attitude would be, I want big muscles so badly, if I persevere and go to the gym religiously for hours every day, eventually I'll achieve my goal. After all, everything I've read and heard in the culture suggests that if I'm relentless, if I remain a slave to my art, through sheer din of unrelenting effort, I must succeed. Well, the joke is on them, how pathetically wrong they are. We live in a reality that is an objective absolute. It is reality and its laws, the laws of nature, which dictate what causes must be enacted to affect the development of a rational mind, the development of a suntan, or the development of muscles beyond normal levels. Neither a wish, a whim, a hope, or dream is sufficient to cause a muscle mass increase. Neither is the application of a false idea or theory blindly accepted. This is the end of side one. Please turn over the tape at this point 
to continue with side two. A person exposed to the sun's ultraviolet rays at the equator in summer would have no slightest concern that the intensity of the stress would be high enough to threaten the physiology sufficiently as to cause an adaptive response, a suntan. While the imposition of a high intensity sunlight stress is the primary causal determinant or first necessary cause, it would not be sufficient cause to affect the development of an optimal suntan. The suntanner's primary concern, his overriding consideration, would be related to secondary and tertiary causes. The proper regulation of the volume and frequency of the exposure time so as not to overdose on the stress stimulus and incur a sunburn or in extreme cases death. A person exposed to high intensity sunlight stress does not fret as to whether he'll succeed in achieving his goal, an optimal suntan, but only so long as he doesn't overexpose. Bodybuilders utilizing the blind, non-theoretical volume approach to training do fret continuously over the prospect of ever developing their muscles because they know absolutely nothing about the nature of the causes required to affect the development of muscles beyond normal levels. They are completely ignorant of the first cause required by nature, training to failure to stimulate the body's growth mechanism into motion, and they remain solely concerned with volume and frequency. Unlike the sun tanner, however, who is rationally concerned with the proper regulation of the exposure of the sunlight stress, the bodybuilder has an irrational obsession with overimposing the training stress. The theory of sun tanning, by the way, is essentially the same as the theory of muscle building, both of which derive from the theory of stress physiology. Recently, one of my phone clients expressed considerable astonishment that he was able to make so much uninterrupted progress with heavy duty, high intensity training. And I explained to him that such should not be a surprise, that there's no mystery to any of this, that people have been growing larger muscles for thousands of years, that we live in a knowable, rational universe, of absolute clear-cut identity guided by one set of never-changing principles and that the cause-effect relationship between intense exercise and muscle growth has been understood for quite some time even though the vast majority of self-styled experts here don't seem to grasp it. I concluded by explaining to this individual that it is reality and its laws, the laws of nature, that dictate what causes must be enacted to affect the buildup of muscle mass beyond normal levels and that once these causes are understood, the task of building bigger muscles while requiring high intensity effort is actually rather simple. With a proper understanding of the law of causality, bodybuilding progress should be, will be immediate, continuous, and nothing short of spectacular through to the full actualization of one's muscular potential in one year or less. That's right it is possible to actualize your full muscular potential in one year or less. While anyone should be able to actualize his muscular potential in one year, no one can guarantee exactly what his potential is, as the prime determinant of bodybuilding success is genetics. And although the subject of genetics, or inherited characteristics, is widely recognized as of central importance in bodybuilding and athletics, it is rarely understood individuals inherit characteristics peculiar to their parents and not common to the species, examples of which are height, eye color, blood type, and body type. These are referred to as fixed genetics traits and thus not typically subject to alteration from exogenous influences. There do exist other inherited traits, however, such as intelligence and muscle size that are not absolutely fixed and can be progressively altered although within a genetically prescribed range. Along with specific psychological motivational factors that the individual must possess or acquire in order to achieve his goals, genetic element is the primary factor determining both the rate of response to intense exercise and the degree of muscular development. So, while anyone can improve upon his level of muscular development with proper training and nutrition, only a small percentage will possess the requisite genetic traits to become champions. The most visible of the physical characteristics necessary for the development of a top physique is related to the skeletal structure. The 
formation of the bones dictates not only how much muscle can be supported, they also determine a significant aspect of the aesthetic quality of the physique. Though the size of the skeleton figures in how much muscle can be supported, the actual size potential of a muscle is determined to a significant extent by its length. Skeletal considerations and muscle belly length, however, are only two inherited characteristics which affect physique potential and were discussed briefly here merely to introduce the listener to the subject. There are numerous others, including muscle fiber density and recovery ability, an elaboration of which is beyond the scope of this work. For those interested in more information on the role of genetics, I suggest you refer to my book, Heavy Duty One. I am often amazed by the Sisyphean efforts of bodybuilders who are willing to train for hours a day, every day for months and years, with literally little or nothing to show for their efforts. It is almost as if they're waiting for a zap out of the mystical realm of whims, wishes, and hopes to one day deliver them their much dreamed of muscles. If you are such an individual, wake up and stop wasting your time. If your present program hasn't been yielding progress for weeks, let alone months or years, it isn't going to start doing so tomorrow. Presumably your life is sacred and the achievement of your goals is of great value significance. It is important, having set a goal, that you successfully achieve it as the implications to your confidence, happiness, and self-esteem are crucial. With a properly conducted, heavy-duty, high-intensity training program, you will grow stronger and larger literally every workout until you reach the upper limits of your muscular potential. Yes, as I've already stated in one year or less. Given your present state of knowledge, such may seem impossible. But remember, it wasn't all that long ago that the great American unwashed thought we'd never get to the moon. Impossible, they said. Of course, without any knowledge of the scientific principles of cosmology or astrophysics, reaching the moon might seem like an insurmountable task. And without the knowledge of the scientific principles of high-intensity anaerobic exercise stress physiology, yes, the idea that you could actualize your muscular potential in one year or less would seem impossible. Let me remind you that man has not only been to the moon, but he has gone and returned safely many times. Sending a man to the moon is an enormously complex task or goal, requiring the application of theoretical knowledge from a constellation of intellectual disciplines, including mathematics, physics, medicine, biology, physiology, electronics, engineering, computer technology, to name a few. If we can send a man to the moon and return him safely every time, we should be able to succeed with every one of our missions to the gym here on Earth. In fact, it should be a cakewalk compared to a moonwalk. Another reason, in addition to my logical identifications of the facts of reality, why I'm able to communicate on a meaningful level with bodybuilders is quite simply because I am a bodybuilder myself. Many of the hopes, dreams, doubts, and fears you may have experienced as a bodybuilder, I've experienced too. So, while it is true that we are all unique as individuals, each in possession of an unrepeatable, irreplaceable personality, it is also true that as human beings we share many things. This brings to mind another statement from Arthur Jones, the man who taught me not only much of considerable value about the nature of exercise, but also about thinking in human beings. On the subject of shared experiences and issues, Mr. Jones said, Mike, if you want to understand others, merely look inside of yourself. Mr. Jones's concept has served me very well over the years as a type of orienting principle with regard to my writing. When searching for a subject or issue to serve as a topic for an article, I would merely invoke Jones's dictum and ask myself, okay, look inside of yourself with regards to this matter. Identify and isolate what you find most relevant, interesting and exciting as both a bodybuilder and a human being, and others will find it likewise. Those shared matters are referred to philosophically as fundamental issues. A fundamental issue, dear listener, is one that pertains to all members of the species, an inescapable part of human existence. Examples of fundamental issues are, is the world knowable or is it mysterious and unknowable? 
our reason and logic man's sole means of gaining knowledge, or our emotions superior means of cognition? Is man a rational, efficacious being, capable of success and happiness, or is he a congenital incompetent, doomed to perpetual doubt and despair? Is the struggle to gain knowledge and learn how to think for myself worth it, or is obeying and pleasing others more important? Should I passively accept the dominant culture's values, or should I look outside the culture to the grand scale context of the history of ideas for something better? Whether one should work to develop a more muscular body is not fundamental, for the issue does not inevitably arise in the course of a normal human life. What is fundamental is whether it is proper to strive for goals at all. And as a title winner, I'd be the last to suggest that developing a more muscular physique is not a worthy goal. A muscular physique, however, is not a viable substitute for a mature mind. That is, a mind with a conceptual grasp and intellectual understanding of the fundamental issues of human life. While you are free, dear listener, to evade the effort and responsibility required to learn how to think and judge independently, and thus deal successfully with that which is of most fundamental importance in human life, you are not free to evade the consequences. No, big muscles do not confer a halo onto your crown or provide one with intellectual confidence and self-esteem. I have known a number of top bodybuilders, men of extraordinary muscular development, who suffered from profound lack of self-esteem, who, despite all their trophies and the public adulation, were riddled with self-doubt and beset by psychological conflicts they had no slightest clue how to resolve. None of this was the result of a deficient or malfunctioning brain. No, they were intellectually self-arrested. Each had apparently decided at an early age that he had learned enough. One of them was a bodybuilder of the absolute first rank, who despite being well known for his massive development, was plagued by chronic doubt as how to proceed with his training, and marred by a number of serious character flaws. While training at Gold's Gym, where I conducted my personal training business, this individual befriended one of my clients, a rank beginner with no muscle to speak of. I was surprised to learn later that the heavily muscled champ had called my client on a number of occasions, once at three in the morning, to ask if there was really any merit to this heavy-duty, high-intensity training, and whether or not he should forsake the volume approach and give it a try. Many make the unwarranted assumption that the top bodybuilding champs must be experts on the subject of exercise. After all, they have the muscles. It is a mistake, however. One cannot cite the apparent success of a couple of dozen of top bodybuilders as indubitable proof that a certain training approach is effective or superior. If one were to look back through the course of their training careers and calculate the hours, months, and even years of wasted effort, time during which they made no progress, one would have to question whether their achievement could properly be termed success at all. You'd conclude by scratching your head and wondering, didn't these men have anything better to do with their time? And many apparently did not. The chant mentioned above, for instance, never gave much time to thinking about his moral character and his development. I can clearly recall a couple of instances in Gold's Gym where this imposing giant of muscle used his greater size to intimidate others of lesser physical stature, once because a person accidentally got in his way while walking to the water fountain for a drink between sets. And I know from an unimpeachable source that there were those who helped this individual financially to get his business started. Their largesse was motivated by sheer benevolence and goodwill, yet were never paid back. It was also widely rumored that he regularly beat up his girlfriends when they didn't wait on him hand and foot precisely as he pleased, which may or may not be true. Obviously, the point is, big muscles are not the measure of a man. As much as these tapes are about the human body and its improvement, they are also about the mind and its improvement. Why would an audio tape series on bodybuilding also be about the mind? Because human intelligence, of course, is what makes it possible to understand anything at all, including exercise, bodybuilding science, and that which is most interesting. 
and that, of course, is us. We, the members of the species man, the divine spark in the great chain of being, the highest of all living species on earth. It has been averred all too often that bodybuilders are dumb or stupid, which simply isn't true as evidenced by the number of phone calls I receive from intelligent bodybuilders every day. These include people from all walks of life, such as medical doctors, lawyers, physicists, stockbrokers, students, and tradesmen, all who happen to be bodybuilders as well. I will not talk down on the assumption that the listener so lacks intellectual depth that he is incapable of exercising the mental effort required to integrate knowledge of a higher order. Nor will I insult your intelligence by expecting you to accept anything I say simply because I've won a few bodybuilding contests. It is only on the basis of grasping the logical truth of an argument that one should agree. I will not bore you with the type of intellectual pablum or garbage you've read so often in some of the muscle magazines. In case you hadn't noticed, the vast majority of articles written on the subject of training consist of little more than a series of arbitrary, out of context, biblical-like commandments, thou shalt perform four sets of this exercise, and thou shalt perform five sets of that one. Why? Blank out, no reason, no logic. The realm of the intellect is more demanding than the average bodybuilding writer recognizes, and that formulating a valid, non-contradictory theory of training requires knowledge of the nature of human physiology, as well as knowledge of the nature of man's mind, and his method of using it, logic. A mere passionate discharge of the arbitrary contents of one's subconscious onto a piece of paper is just that, intellectual vomitus. As a man of reason, I act only on the basis of understanding the reasons for doing something, as all mature adults should, and that is what these tapes are about. A reason principled approach to bodybuilding, one that can be learned by anyone willing to exercise the required mental effort. I presume, after all, that you purchase these tapes because of your enthusiastic desire to be a successful bodybuilder, whether to actualize your muscular potential for personal reasons, or to be Mr. New England, Mr. Midwest, or Mr. Olympia, and that you already understand that the basis of a rational approach to bodybuilding, or any other arena of endeavor, is the recognition that only the specific appropriate knowledge can lead one to engage in the purposeful action required to achieve a goal. No, the material on these tapes is not infinitely complex, but it's not intellectual pabulum either. Why not cast aside all other concerns for now, get intense mentally, focus on the logic of my ideas, and once and for all clear up any and all confusion? Then you will be able to proceed with the greatest power possible to a human being, the power of certainty. It only stands to reason that a serious bodybuilder should want to know that the ideas guiding his training efforts are true ideas. And how will he ever come to distinguish true ideas from false ideas unless he learns something about the nature of ideas or knowledge? To settle for anything less than certainty about the truth of the ideas guiding you in the pursuit of your life's goals is to abdicate your most fundamental responsibility as a human being and leave your life literally to chance. I entered into a personal renaissance of my own once I began a serious formal study of philosophy and learned something about the nature of knowledge. I learned that knowledge, like everything else that exists, has identity and nature. Human knowledge is hierarchical in structure. It has a foundation or base consisting of fundamental principles, which must first be grasped before one may move upward in logical progression to more complex derivative knowledge. This may be most readily observed in mathematics, where the fundamentals are addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It is only on the basis of having grasped these fundamentals that one may move up the logical hierarchy to derivative aspects such as algebra and calculus. Algebra and calculus, in other words, are logically based on and derived from an understanding of the fundamentals. There does exist a viable intellectual discipline, exercise science. On tape number two, I will explain the logically interdependent hierarchy of ideas that may...
the context of bodybuilding science, again, so that you may learn to think logically about the subject and go on to confidently and successfully achieve your bodybuilding goals. Before concluding, however, I am going to address one important issue which will serve as a direct prelude to the material on tape two. And it has to do with the near universal confusion that exists with regard to the fact that there can only be one valid theory of proper productive bodybuilding exercise or any other subject. This confusion is centrally responsible for most of the failures in bodybuilding. And I can tell you unequivocally, without a doubt, more fail to achieve their bodybuilding goals than succeed. Most bodybuilders make the mistake of approaching the subject of training with the idea that all training theories have some merit or are of equal validity, then they waste precious, precious time, frantically trying one after the other in the hope that someday, somehow, some way they'll find one that works. And as a result, few bodybuilders achieve their goals. It could not possibly be true that all or many, or even two, training theories are valid, since a theory is a set of abstract principles which purports to be either a correct description of some aspect of reality and or a guide for successful human action, and there is only one reality, there is and can be therefore only one valid theory of any aspect of reality. There's no debate on the subject, just as there is only one valid theory of epistemology mathematics, electricity, chemistry, physics, evolution, relativity. Likewise, there is but one true theory of productive bodybuilding exercise. And it just so happens to be the theory of high intensity training. The science of exercise, like the science of medicine, is based on an understanding of the principles of human physiology, which of course are universal, that is applicable to all human beings. If everyone's cells, muscles, and organs were constituted and functioned differently, if everyone was a unique physiologic entity unto himself, medical science could not exist as a viable discipline. Doctors couldn't make diagnoses, perform surgeries, or dispense medicines. It is this fact, the fact that the principles of human physiology are universal, that makes it possible for me to state with absolute certainty there is only one valid theory of training, i.e. one best way to train. It is not my mere opinion that every human being requires intense training to stimulate growth. It is a well-authenticated fact beyond debate. And because the magnitude of the toll on the body's limited recovery ability made by high intensity training is enormous, such training must be brief and infrequent to allow for the production of an increase. The major philosophic theme of these tapes is that without a firm intellectual grasp of and guidance by a valid theory, one cannot be certain he is on the right course. A sane individual setting out on a trip from Los Angeles to New York will consult a map, a map being a theory of how to get from one place to another. Without it, he would get lost, lose whatever certainty and motivation he may have had, and terminate his effort along the way. Knowledge like any other value, has to be gained through a volitional effort. Anyone smart enough to learn the ABCs, write a sentence, or read a book, can, with enough effort, integrate and make use of the knowledge contained on these tapes. It's not likely that you'll get it on the first listening, however, so listen to the tapes repeatedly until you do have a firm grasp. This is the end of tape one. Please go on to tape two the fundamentals of muscular development.